Good evening, everybody. Welcome to one more of our lectures. Uh, it's super that we have Lois Weinthal with us tonight. And um, I will pass the baton to uh, Professor Schaefer, who will do the introduction. Thank you again for joining us. And please stay for the Q&A afterwards. You can put in questions in the chat while the lecture is going on or at the end, and we will sift through them and collate them and ask them as many as we can. Thank you again and, and welcome Lois to Marcus. Thanks, Madad. Welcome everybody. Um, thank you so much for coming to an, another one of these lectures that are virtual. I know, I know you're all zoomed out from studio and other classes today, um, but thank you for joining us. Our guest tonight is architect, designer, author, theorist and chair of interior design um, at Ryerson in Toronto, Lois Weinthal. Lois is a graduate of the, the Department of Architecture at the Rhode Island School of Design and of the Department of Architecture at the Cranbrook Academy of Art. Prior to her appointment at Ryerson, she was at the University of Texas and at the New School in New York City. And she currently holds a position of honorary professor at the Glasgow School of Art, which um, just sounds like such a great gig, honorary professor. Um, so so th there's a couple of things that I just wanna say briefly about why Lois is here tonight. Um, for me, reading through her publication Toward a New Interior, um, from 2011, I came across just some so many things about interior spaces, um, how much time we spend in interior spaces, phenomena, quality, um, ideas of interior that just are, are so rich. And I highly recommend the book. And I wanna put out a big thank you to our librarians who have made so much of Lois's um, readings and, and writings available to the community. So thank you to our librarians, but, but in this book, um, you know, there, there's just staggering ideas of how much time human beings spend inside as opposed to outdoors and, and how, um, you know, I think it's an understatement to say today that we, the entire world, are essentially spending way too much time indoors. Um, and, and as a result, if you're if you're reading magazines, if you're if you're following um, blogs online, it's been striking to see that architects have kind of done a 180 from from looking at the building from the outside and making an assessment to actually being inside their buildings, turning around and saying like, oh my God, look at this interior, <laughs> like we we got to fix this, we got to change this, um, and so you know while we've been doing this this turnaround and and kind of refocusing our gaze on the interior, um, Lois has been there. For, for years and years. And, and in this position, um, she's been really observing and writing and, and kind of clearly articulating um, the material phenomena um, and, 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 and the moods that, that kind of constitute interior architecture. Um, animated walls, furnitures, curtains, bed linens, the clothing we wear. I mean, to read her writing, it's just very rich in connecting um, all of these things from the body to where the, build, the building begins. And, and I think as our buildings dematerialize, as, as the poche essentially disappears, um, her expertise and her writing becomes all the more important. So please help me welcome Lois Weinthal to Penn State. Hello. Um, thank you so much, Marcus, for that incredible introduction. I need you to show up to every one of my classes and do that every time. <laughs> that would be really nice. And also, thank you, Mir Dodd. And it is just such a pleasure to be part of this lecture series. Um, it's just really such an honor to be here. So thank you so much for joining you know, all of us on the, in this evening when I know everybody probably is tired from studio and all of those things. But hopefully this will help you know, fill you with some fun things to think about um, as you look around your interior. So at this point, I will go ahead and share my screen. So that way we can start and I can jump right in. So I'm hoping you can see everything. And the title of this talk, Elastic Poche, 
alludes to interiors as being conducive to soft surfaces that allow flexibility or movability of interior elements to keep spaces adjustable or elastic. These characteristics make a distinction from architecture, which is static and load bearing, whereas interiors are non load bearing and have flexibility. At the same time, poche is understood as the thickness of a wall, often represented as a thick line in architectural drawing. This void or space of the wall pocket has the potential to invite elasticity, which prompts alternative approaches to shaping poche. I find that related design disciplines do this best because many rely upon the space of interiors in order for their work to come to fruition. So to expand upon this further, this talk will be organized around four parts that explore the idea of elastic poche in the context of interiors. The first section starts with bubbles. I think we're all familiar with this and this spatial container that we have found ourselves in during this time of COVID-19. The next section is on flexibility and shifts the gaze from bubbles and looks to designers from a range of disciplines whose works offer ways to make to making that contribute to the inside of our bubbles. And from there, I would like to share examples of student work that integrates ideas of elasticity and poche to reshape familiar layers around us. And finally, a few collaborations in and out of our School of Interior Design at Ryerson. So elasticity holds possibilities. It is not rigid and allows flexibility and adjustment. And this past year has needed a lot of adjustment. And at one point, trying to even acquire elastic, the type you would search for, you know, on Amazon for sewing projects was unavailable or would be shipped, you know, in maybe three to four months. I am still waiting for my roll of elastic, which I think I ordered probably eight months ago. And this was, you know, right when everybody realized, oh my God, I should be making a mask. And so that was what caused all of the, the need for elastic. So the pandemic made me look at this diagram from my theory book in a new way, which was originally designed as a way to organize layers that surround us from body to objects, to surfaces and the wall poche of interior and exterior. The bubbles move in and out of one another and have no definitive anchor because these layers that we experience are inherently flexible. So revisiting this diagram, especially at, as the term bubble became common usage in our everyday, whether you know it is the six foot or two meter bubble or only allowing five or 10 people to be in your bubble, it helped give new dimension to these layers. And this new version was developed with my research student, Alice Wenhe Wang over many Zoom calls and emails. So I would like to thank her for that help in giving this shape. And the six foot or two meter range is the recommended gauge for interacting on the interior with a mask. This range also borrows terminology from existing diagrams on proxemics, such as what you can see on the left being the standard distance relationships among people, which recognizes four established distances being intimate, personal, social as in social distancing and public. And it acts as a guide for how interior designers program spaces to accommodate usage. I like to think of these distance distances as fitting inside of the diagram to the right to add context with interior elements because we never really stand in isolation in these ranges. An entry in the index from this book also became more relevant, which highlights health issues. The subtopics under health issues coincide with how we live during the pandemic by looking at areas such as risk, time spent indoors, and ventilation as factors that can be seen directly related to interiors and the pandemic. And the index points to pollutants on the interior, which can now be substituted with infected droplets. In this last year, masks have helped mitigate the transmission of infected droplets that we emit through a sneeze, a cough, or talking, or in some cases even singing, which kind of opened up the world to realizing that's how droplets can be um, transmitted. And so it only works when everyone is wearing a mask to prevent that from happening. And this research by Dr. Lydia Burweba documents the cloud of droplets that can be emitted. In the shorter range on the left, droplets can travel a little under four feet, while from a sneeze, 
droplets can span approximately 23 to 27 feet. And if you haven't seen these videos, um, maybe at some point I can try and add them into the chat, but they are just like, they're beautiful to see, even though you're kind of like, it's a sneeze, <laughs> I'm watching droplets move, but, um, but they're just done in a way that they're just really beautiful to understand, seeing things that are invisible. So Dr. Burweba explains how, like a cloud, the droplets can change depending upon the humidity and the path and direction can also change depending, depending upon a room's ventilation and airflow direction from HVAC systems. Eventually the droplets disperse and better yet, if a person is wearing a mask, most of this will be caught in the fibers before entering into an airflow. In a very simple diagram with a few other figures added, this one takes the layers that we occupy on the interior and brings in the cloud of a sneeze, where the six foot distance without a mask becomes irrelevant because the aerosolized small droplets can travel to the outer bubble. And so what I would like to propose is that rather than the six foot distance becoming a standard, that instead we rethink our interiors. Within a year, so many everyday spaces have had to adjust and become elastic. Homes have seen more curtains be put up to divide spaces as temporary solutions to support work or study spaces, while restaurants, grocery stores, and pharmacies have put up temporary plastic variations of oversized sneeze guards. While waiting for vaccines, unless you've been one of the lucky ones to already have one, we are all still living in our bubbles. And designers can consider how to better design these elements on the interior and the layers that we inhabit that show up in this diagram so that they can support the interior and new configurations. So variations are inherent to the interior and can appear in strategic ways and be programmed into a range of spaces each flu season. So roughly, you know, the same time that yearly flu shots are given, we can also start reconfiguring our interiors. It's a way to be proactive rather than reactive with our interiors. In the next few images, most of them are taken from my theory book and seen through the lens of droplet transmission. As a result, I've taken the liberty of altering a few with diagrammatic changes to see how cues in these works could prompt change. By looking to conceptual works, such as this installation by Diller and Scafidio, there are already clues in furniture construction that inherently support elasticity, such as the leaf tucked under a dining room table. It allows for expansion to accommodate more people, but in the context of limiting exposure when eating and talking, the cut line in the table where those, the table pulls apart could actually be used to pull it farther apart for a distance greater than six feet to accommodate fewer people rather than more. This approach could also find its way into schools. While kids attend in-person school, masks are worn all day, but lunchtime is where separation is needed when masks come off. There are opportunities already evident in familiar interior forms, such as this one, which could prompt new furniture design. And this image from Le Corbusier's essay, The Decorative Art of Today, sought to make an argument to move architecture and design away from the Victorian era and into interiors of industrial made objects by prompting them as healthier environments. He reinforces this argument in the context of an office where the highlighted reflection on the surface of the desk is used to legitimize his argument and reinforce the need to break from the past. The need for a healthy workspace has already been implemented in makeshift configurations evident in commercial spaces from cafes to hardware stores where plexiglass screens or plastic sheets aim to mitigate the spread of particles or droplets that can reach another person. Plexiglass allows workers to still have visibility and it also can be wiped clean. And I would like to highlight this bright and shiny desk surface since it does make the argument for surfaces that can be wiped clean. In fact, it is more relevant than ever. And referring back to Dr. Burweba's research, she writes, droplets that settle along the trajectory can contaminate surfaces. 
while the rest remain trapped and clustered in the moving cloud. And in another paper by Parvin et al., they note in their research, research that cleaning is fundamental to infection control. It's pretty obvious. But what they found is that even 50 wipes with a cloth cannot remove a complex and realistic biofilm from a surface. Even the aerosol spread of small droplets in combination with airflow from HVAC systems means that these small droplets can get resuspended and flow back into the air. Together, designers need to consider all these factors in relationship to one another since they are not independent. So at this point, I would like to move into the next part of this talk on flexibility. But I would also like to carry over some of the ideas that were just brought up in the context of bubbles, since many of them are ways that we're looking at how our spaces are changing, how poche can change, how spaces essentially are aiming to be elastic and adjustable. And so the next few slides in this area of flexibility will look at layers that we inhabit. And most of them are looking at disciplines that rely upon the interior in order to see how, when we work in the interior, there's new ways of seeing how things like textiles or furniture or ceramics or a whole range of objects can change. And so it opens up our way of looking at things just a little bit more. And many of them also are kind of straddling between two different disciplines. But I think like most of our spaces and the bubbles that we occupy, um, there is this overlap and flexibility that does happen. So while Dr. Burweba's research begins with measurement from the body, the technology used is significant in making visible the invisible. And the interior is all about bodies and designers do their best to program spaces to anticipate the best possible usage. These images from Frank and Lillian Gilbreth from 1917 in their motion, motion study films captured the movement based on repetitive work. A point of light attached to a finger provided information that could be used toward productivity and ergonomics. A set of dashed lines representing time and duration seen in the lower image takes the static lines of architecture one step further they reveal the action of movements, an expanding and contracting line of elastic space. So for example, the top one is moving a little slow, which is why the light continues to show up. But on ones where the light almost becomes a, a scattered dot is when the light is moving really fast. And so time actually becomes embedded in what we could think of as a series of line weights that could inform our drawings. And so what I'm doing here is I'll be working out from the body, out through all the layers until we finally reach the layer of what is the interior enclosure. And so in this example, more recently, Francois Brumont with his design practice Inflections collaborated with the Ying Museum and provides an updated version of mapping the body in motion with an infrared camera to record, track, and interpret the hand gestures of the artist during the ceramic throwing process. These gestures were transformed in real time into a three-dimensional graphic landscape on the computer screen. And you can see the lights kind of bouncing around and they change with elasticity as the hands continue to move. But going back a little bit from there, lesser known in the disciplines of interiors, interiors and architecture are studies of movements in the domestic realm by Jane Callahan and Catherine Palmer. Their work was the precursor to essentially motion capture technology. This example shows documentation through drawing and photography of a man dressing. It is a familiar act, pulling a shirt or sweater over the head and the movement of the body to adjust. The middle image is a composite view where an elastic bubble begins to form around the body and brings representation to the space that we take up when we're dressing. When the model is made on the far right, we are given a static 3D view generated from these drawings and photographs. While the previous examples document the body in motion and the immediate space of extension, it leads to the next layer that surrounds us, which is clothing. And in these garments by Ray Kawakubo 
Fabric is compressed to the body with a few simple vertical and horizontal stitches strategically placed on the body, such as the chest, waist, and hips, which are usually measurement lines that are used anyways in clothing design. But if unstitched, the excess material suggests that textiles can claim a greater amount of space. Much like you know, the man kind of putting on his sweater or taking it off claims a greater amount of space. And so someone else who also um, works with extending material, maybe I will. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't really want the sound on that one, <laughs> but there is a video with it um, that shows Rebecca Horn's ability to take these wings that she's designed and she's unfolding them. And it's a way of also taking clothing or having it extend from clothing and beginning to have it extend into space. And similarly, the fashion designer Noah Revive uses software programs to design and integrate digital glitches to make new patterns for the body. The glitches often generated from the body make it seem as if it's elastic in ways that we are not used to seeing. It's as if parts are being pulled and stretched into new forms, but always still generated and extending from the body. And then she finally takes these forms and transforms them into garments that result in decorative forms that have a direct relationship back to the body from where they were generated sometimes attached at the hip, other times beginning to actually circumscribe around the body. Similarly, these designs by Mako Takeda, which you may have seen if you are, you know, if you follow Bjork at all, you may have seen her wearing some of these pieces. They take the form of what we could almost say as being masks and continue to spread and move along the body. Although they appear spiky, they are actually soft and flexible. These suggest an alternative form to covering the body. Not quite the mask we expect, but it still offers the idea of depth to a mask. So another clothing designer, Hussein Chalayan, makes clothing and upholstery interchangeable. And these are a few stills from one of his fashion uh, runway shows where the sequence shows the models starting from the left and moving to the right. And they come out and they start un like, like snapping and zipping the upholstery on the furniture. They turn it inside out and then step into it and then start snapping it into place. And what it makes us realize is that furniture, clothing, that layer of upholstery, it somehow bridges body and furniture. It makes us realize that we actually do have this overlap area between these two disciplines where one could learn from the other. And in one that is a little different, um, but almost begins to extend you know, the body into the discipline of furniture making is this table where the model comes out, pulls out the centerpiece, pulls out this telescoping uh, table into a skirt and connects it onto a belt. And so while it may not be the most functional to wear, it gives us ideas much like the top piece as well, where we're often shaping materials like wood to accept the body in furniture. But in this case, Hussein Chalian takes those ideas of how we shape wood and brings it directly to the body. So moving just a little bit further out from the body, this is a example of a project by Hella Jongarius called Embroidered Tablecloth, where she looks at things that are just, you know, every day, if you're having a nice dinner, you might put out a tablecloth, your dishware. And for her, it's not so much about seeing them as singular separate elements, but really thinking about the connection between them or the role that pattern can play and how a pattern can be the piece that actually binds the two together. So once again, you know, maybe not the most functional, you don't know if it should go in the dishwasher or the washing machine, but it's about that space that connects with the thread and the thread that loops back and forth and has to remake the type of plate that's being used. And so where we think about you know, the two often being separate, she's suddenly literally stitching them together. And so in another version um, that's more digital, Jeffrey Mann, he is a ceramicist and works with glassware, and he uses a software for sound waves to model how it can begin to adjust familiar objects and alter them. So they also read as being elastic. 
So what you're looking at is a still that's all digital and running through it at the same time is a dialogue from the film American Beauty, where there's a family dispute at the table. And so he uses the software that takes the sound and has it essentially run as sound waves through these forms. And so what you're seeing is if forms that we often think of as being stat static, like glass or porcelain or dishware, suddenly they pick up those sound waves and animate it. At the same time, we know glass, ceramics, um, even metals do have fluid states. And so the two pieces of silverware on the right, what you're seeing are those are pieces that actually were made from this series. And this is a project which is one of a selection that is being included in a forthcoming book with my colleague and co-editor Jonathan Anderson. And the book is titled Digital Fabrication in Interior Design, Body, Object, and Closure. And so as we move, I guess, off the table, but maybe still looking at tables, and a project that really plays with poche is one by Alan Wexler. And he took a conventional vinyl mill for shed, and this is the kind that's just prefabricated and can be bought, shows up in a lot of you know, backyards. And he really plays with poche in terms of the idea of storage. So while the shed is meant to be storage, he actually reconstructs the wall so it in itself becomes the space of storage. So there's a really nice play on how we can think about poche and storage. And moving towards these layers that begin to surround us, um, one person's work I always like to look at is Petra Blaze with her office Inside Outside. And her work is known for working with textiles and curtains and not just for you know, putting a curtain down in elevation view, but for the way they unfold or move around in space. And in this project on the left, the curtain rail in the ceiling at the Kunsthalle on the left is not an afterthought. You know, it's not just the rail that was attached to the ceiling afterwards. Instead, it actually binds itself to the ceiling plane and inserts the interior in the structure in ways that are not conventional building practices. On the right is another project from the Mercedes-Benz Museum in Stuttgart, and it's called the Brush Wall. And it has similar characteristics to Mako Takeda's work, you know, the one that Bjork wears, those, those forms. And and while these surfaces, you know, it's a spiky surface that literally you can see the hand kind of brushing across the surface of it. So it is like a brush wall. And this surface was primarily meant to absorb sound, which it does a great job of doing because it's breaking up all those sound waves. And while this and Takeda's work may not necessarily be conducive to prevent transmissions of droplets by airflow, they do suggest that soft, pliable, yet thick forms can reshape our poche. So the work from Inside Outside asks us to forget the conventions that we know, such as the top image of drapery carriers. So unless you can see them in a different way, um, there's other ways of looking at that. And in comparison, I always like to show a sine wave because sine waves are meant to be flexible. They expand and contract. And at the same time, curtains do that too. And so just the connection between the two hopefully opens up new opportunities for how we do think about those flexible elements that we bring into the interior. And one person who does this really well is Mark, Mark West. And he formed a group when he was at the University of Manitoba called CAST. And um, they have an incredible facility. You can see it, I'll show it to you in the next slide, but it's a, just a really nice space to work in. And they do a lot of castings. And a lot of it is done with textiles that are kind of like these large scale textile castings. And so what's nice about seeing these is you can see where he's working with the, the formwork, um, showing these dashed lines where textiles can, you know, where they're gonna be receiving different forces. And then finally, some of the castings that show up. And from there, another version is, and this gives you a sense of that space that's in Manitoba. Um, lots of room in Manitoba, that I can say. <laughs> and there's this type of casting, which it almost makes you have to flip back and forth between you know, you see textile, you understand the sense of draping, but it's also captured in concrete, which is what we would not expect to see. So it's a really nice pairing of the, these ideas that kind of make us rethink those conventions. Um, in a different project, Jorge Otero Pelos, an architectural preservationist, 
captures the subtle layer of dust and dirt that invisibly coats the interior. As a preservationist, his main intent is to research and preserve architecture, which includes looking microscopically at interior surfaces in order to tell the less visible history of a building. And so he's developed this system of essentially using a, a latex that helps pick up dust and dirt that's formed on the inside. And this was one from a former aluminum factory, um, which is pretty interesting because he's able to then analyze what shows up on these strips. And they're kind of like large microscopic slides, but it shows the, you know, the elements that have been in the air, which then could also tell more about what workers are breathing in. So it leads back to this idea of indoor air quality and what happens in the spaces around us with our, with our air. Um, this is another project he worked on for the Venice Art Biennale. And he did the same process. The wall on the right in the Doge's Palace was picked up with his system of capturing the dirt and dust. And so essentially everything was caught on there. But what's interesting is that it gives a viewer a chance to almost occupy the space behind the dust, like to have a moment to actually, you know, stand in that space that we normally never have access to. And by making dust visible, we can start understanding all the things that, that get captured in the air. Um, normally I don't show, you know, charts and numbers, but this one is a really interesting one. It's from a book called The Secret Life of Dust by Hannah Holmes. And I think it's also really relevant right now because it shows all these different dimensions that we can see of how measurements take place at really minuscule scales at microns. I feel like in, you know, the world of architecture interiors, we never really talk about our spaces in terms of microns, but when we look at air, that's when we have to. And so just to give you a sense of what a micron is, um, that dimension, or if we relate it back to something familiar, like one inch is 25,000 microns, a human hair is 100. As we start moving down to things like, you know, dust, 63, pollen, um, if you're ever wondering why, you know, <laughs> pollen so small um, gets into your lungs, and finally, things like bacteria is really small and especially smoke um, makes you realize that these things can really get further into your lungs and they get past the sticky traps that stand guard that protect your head and chest. Um, so great book, I suggest it. <laughs> and going back to these layers that, that kind of bump up to our interiors, this is a really beautiful project by Dohosa. Um, and he works with ideas of homeland and identity. And for him, he grew up in Korea, but lived for uh, a very long time and still goes back and forth between Korea and the US. And so for him, this is one way of expressing ideas of how do you merge these two identities together? And so he uses textiles to reconstruct one home. And this is one home that he lived, with, lived in in the US. This might be actually the Providence home. And then inside of it, you can see suspended the traditional Korean home. And so for him, it's a way of bringing these two ideas together. And in another example that looks at these surfaces that come up and meet the interior walls, we can look to El and Itsui's work. And he develops new layers of poche by using found objects, aluminum, bo aluminum bottle caps and copper wire. And similar to things like the roll of thread, the copper wire plays a role in allowing a subtle hinge and fold to these surfaces. And that's what gives them these incredible drapes. And at the same time, new spaces of poche are developed as gravity and folds meet. And when I've seen these pieces, I've always, I always try to sneak in and like see, you know, between the, the surface and the wall. And there are strategic armatures that help support it so it can find these nice drapes. And another one that uses bottle tops, seals around bottles, materials that would be thrown away, but here recycled into these new surfaces. And even at the very top, you can see how when it turns over that there's even the backside, which has its own surface to it. But in this version, um, I wanted to show this one as a way of getting to the details and understanding every single one of those units that connects and connects and connects and even how other patterns are allowed to come into it and connect through the detailing of that copper wire, which really helps form one pattern into another pattern. 
And then just a few more in this part, but wanted to look at Abelardo Morel's work. And he's a photographer um, who works with pinhole cameras, camera obscuras. And the way he sets these up, I know many of you are probably familiar with this, but I'll just give a kind of quick overview of what they are. But he essentially goes into a room. A lot of the times he'll work in hotel rooms um, because it sets a different kind of background to things. And so he'll block off all light except for at a window, he'll leave open what essentially is like a pinhole, maybe about a quarter of an inch. And the way the optics work is that what's outside goes and passes through that hole and it really acts as a lens that reverses and flips the image, which is why you're seeing this image upside down in this room. And then he sets up a camera on a tripod and leaves the shutter open for about eight hours. So, you know, you're, if you still have your analog camera, hold on to them. They're great for this. And so this is one result that shows up. And he describes these views as what a room sees, um, which is such a nice way of flipping it from what we see to actually saying, well, what does the room see? Another example looks at um, a room in Boston, a hotel room. And so the last image in this um, section on flexibility, I just want to finish with this image. And it's just to follow up on this idea of light passing through Pochet. And this drawing was generated from thinking about a shaft of light entering into what I saw as multiple units where surfaces of Pochet were peeled off to see how light could span from one room to another, that there's so much potential in Pochet. In Pochet. And not so different from how we can imagine spanning from one room to another, but light can also play a role in that as well. So, you know, that's my hopeful project someday I'll work on. And in this next section of the talk, I would like to share with you student work that has ideas of elasticity and poche running throughout them. Um, and so there might be some glitches to this, but I'll just let it run for a second. And so, in this example, um, now that we're all in our bubbles working, there's been, I feel like just a lot of being busy in the home. And so these are my sets of videos that I make, you know, maybe every couple of weeks as students move into their next assignment. Um, we're still making bubbles, but we're now casting bubbles. And some will show these in different materials, um, but this has been part of what's been happening so far this semester. And so this is one area that I'd like to begin with that still builds upon this idea of bubbles, poche, and I'll be showing works from a first year course, which I'm actually teaching right now, and a fourth year course. And just to give a sense of how some of these things find their way um, throughout our program. But in the beginning, we have students working with cast forms, a lot of hydrocal, it's a great material, um, you know, it's, uh, can be elastic in the sense that it can fill, you know, any type of form work, as long as you do your form work right. And so we have students cast and make two different boxes. One is filled with balloons, not with water, just with air. And we cast that space. And then we also have students work with plasticine where it's just a natural form made by their hand. And then you can see how there's some dashed lines that move across these, and that's getting ready to cut them in X, Y, and Z axes. So that way students can start learning about orthographic projection at the same time. And all of this is to really get inside, to try and get inside of these spaces. Um, we also do some drawings that map them out. And then finally, uh, our students are great at using our workshop. We kind of throw them in and you know, lots of tutorials, lots of training. So they really understand how materials work, um, whether it's through you know, cutting up the bandsaw or handsaw but eventually we cut these open and they're kind of like you know opening up an egg and finding this nice void inside. So I'll just walk you through, you know, uh, whoops, a few of them. I missed that one too quickly. Um, and so they start, you know, having more and more pieces as they start, start cutting through the X, Y, and Z axes. But eventually it's always trying to find a way to make this void and then seeing how its relationship spans to you know, the poche until we finally get to the perimeter and that relationship across them. And just a few more examples where, you know, the plasticine is starting to come out of one, it's still in the other, um, still waiting to be dug out. And students also scan the surfaces because we start using them as essentially a way of 
drawing with them, setting them up in relationship, using the logic of orthographic drawing, but then beginning to add depth to them and layers so they can start bringing it into a three-dimensional space. So some of the examples that come out look like this one um, from Nicholas, where he collaged in his different scans of his cast forms. And this one from Emily, um, she had a lot of forms <laughs> that she was working with. And you can start seeing some of the relationships across these. And this is where we start talking about this idea of elasticity because the forms are cut open, pulled apart, and eventually we want to document that. And that's where we start bringing in these, you know, light dashed lines as a way of thinking about how to document this, you know, this expanding and pulling apart, but also tracking the forms as they kind of move across their own little field as if it's, you know, part of a larger interior. And another version um, that's used, and this one led to this construction on the left by Joelle. And in other versions, you can see the one on the right um, by Bailly. And all of these were done during the pandemic last March and April. So I was so amazed to see these come out from working at home. And another one, you saw a few of those images by Emily, but this shows the overall and then these beautiful little, you know, kind of moments that are from the cast forms. And even though they break apart sometimes while they're being cut, they still are so significant in forming a relationship back to the larger whole. So this is how we get students to start thinking about pochet, um, pulling things apart, finding those interior spaces. But by time I get them again in fourth year, I like to show them you know, other ways of continuing to work with plaster. And so the next set of images kind of shift over into a fourth year seminar that I teach in our undergraduate program. And plaster returns in this course since it is a material that spans body and interior. And in this assignment, students cast a space of threshold between body, object, and interior. And this one resulted in a direct connection between these layers, and it is evident through the void of the foot. And I was kind of surprised to see like, oh, that's the space that a foot occupies. <laughs> and the imprint on the left even shows the void of the wood floorboards under her foot. So you can see a little bit of that vertical line. The flexibility of the material allows for those connections to be made visible. And that's one of the nice things about plaster gauze in doing that. Similarly, this one where the hand is captured holding onto an object um, from a few multiple views. And then the course continues with more readings to that, that basically look at interiors and theory, which leads to casting the body to understand the immediate space that we occupy, but now seeing it in a static version. And so students are asked to choose an area that allows plaster gauze to wrap with ease, preferably somewhere on the torso, so it relates to the next assignment that I give them. And while the cast mimics the body, it also builds up with distortion, much like our clothing is a generalization of the body. We consider clothing to be the next layer that surrounds us, but as a cast reveals the interstitial space between the body and clothing. And much like our pockets inside of our clothes and the thickness of a wall, there is that gap or distortion that begins to form. And so these castings go together with a shirt alteration project that I give my students. It has a lot of rules and is methodical because I would rather they discover forms through some kind of logic that would lead to something that maybe they could not have anticipated. And in this example, Natanya cast her body in plaster as a means of making an oversized Oxford shirt underneath fit her body. So the inside of the shirt, the part that you're not seeing, except for some of those beautiful folds in the left in her drawing, um, that they're being caught on the inside, inside of the plaster. So the outside smooths out the wrinkles, but the inside is where they're all captured. So the inside of the shirt is something else completely. And the same thing with this project by Veronica, where she cast her friend's shoulder and wanted to overlap with the idea of what a shirt is, and then took a shirt and kept wanting to fold it, fold it, fold it until it finally became as close as she could get it to being like the cast space of the shoulder. Or in this one um, by Haley, some of the ideas embedded in altering the shirt include developing a system that is inherent 
to the shirt or the body as a means of being guided by logic rather, rather than style or fashion. So in this one, she went through every seam of the shirt, made a half inch mark along the way, and then ran a thread through it and scrunched it up. And so she ended up with these really nice forms that um, somehow still let the shirt fit, which was interesting to see, even though she scrunched up all of those areas. So another one um, starts working with ways that we alter textiles through smocking. And so Annika was working with ideas of, you know, wrinkles and folds and started ironing and realized that ironing, al ironing also helped her develop the smocking pattern. And she borrowed one of her classmates to once again, take an oversized shirt and have it fit the body. And the key areas to doing that were the waist and the arms, and then everything else almost became an extension of detail or almost even, you know, ornament as you start seeing in the resulting pleats in this surface. And then she also went one step further and decided to take this and imagine bringing it as a curtain that could span many rooms in, for example, even in our own building, where if she took this mocking pattern, but brought it to different materials, then they would bring different properties back to the space. So for example, when she worked with um, something like felt, which has really great, you know, an ability to absorb acoustics, she knows that if that could cover a space where it needed some sound dampening, that would be the place for it to happen. Or something more sheer, where if you wanted translucency, but still some, you know, marker of having spaces divided, then that would be the material to use. So for her, the result was this continuous curtain that could compress and, ex and expand and begin to assign new roles to the spaces that it was covering. So often when I develop these design problems, I like to also include information like this where we talk about making, but making through ideas of how things perform or how the forms are actually made. And so, I break them down into different categories where under performance, there's ideas of precedence, but precedent doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be you know, residential or commercial. We know that to the interior, precedents include things like curtains, clothing, upholstery, or just the space of a room. And programs also don't have to fall under being you know, commercial, residential, um, hospitality. They can actually, we can program things for a site or for a function, a fit, a structure. Um, the same thing with form making. Tools can be any tool, but when you start pairing together a sewing machine, a drill press, a laser cutter, you realize that they all do the same thing, but in different ways and different materials. Um, form work can be a dress form, molds, and so on. And materials are not necessarily, lo necessarily looked at for being a textile or glass um, or wood, but for their pliability, their castable, formable, drapeable. And so in some assignments, I ask students to, you know, find their own example or some of these and then pair them up. And so a student might work on something where, you know, their, pro their, you know, their precedent is a, a curtain. It has to be structural but pliable, made with a laser cutter and a vacuum press. And the idea is that they can't automatically determine what it will be in the end, but it gets them kind of, you know, to start making and seeing what can be produced from that. And so um, the next few examples are just a few that kind of zoom into um, a few small, very clear projects, just so I can connect them together in these next few images where students were transitioning from ways of working with textiles to working with casting them in plaster. And they're really generated from ideas of clothing rather than ideas of curtain. And so in this one example by Danielle, she was looking and once again, literally working with elastic and this form that was applied to her shoulder, where it was a smocking pattern that she could expand and contract um, with her arm moving and took that smocking pattern and brought it over to form work. And the bottom image shows her, you know, the first casting, you know, trying to work out all the kinks and getting the textile caught in the plaster, but eventually got it to the point where she was able to figure out how to work with the smocking pattern. But begin to almost readjust the making of it in the in that pattern so it could be receptive to having plaster poured into it. And so it almost became like a system for making a unit. 
And she started understanding so well how the form work with textiles had to work that she could actually build in these apertures that let air and light flow through them. It's kind of where, you know, the material kind of crosses over and compresses at the tightest point. And that became the moment of like, oh, like aperture can happen. And in another version by Riva, she was also working with different, these kind of crossing over patterns in the shirt. And you're seeing the inside and outside version of that. And then wanted to bring that to the idea of a pocket and how could she reconstruct a pocket that could once again be receptive to plaster. And started off with, you know, the version at the top and realized things just like she couldn't find a way to get an opening in there. And then finally in the bottom two, where she kept sewing and sewing and sewing into this pocket, realized that she finally found the right pattern for being able to make this opening in the cast form that grew out of this idea that stemmed back to the shirt. And in another one by Luell, she was working with folding and pleating. And so that little orange model, it's just a simple paper model that was an accordion fold. And then she cut some um, like just scored a few segments in it and then use that realizing, oh, if she can find a way to make those voids within the form work, then she could start changing the way that we look at pleats and shift them into what could be the inside of a wall with apertures to the outside. And so the form work, you know, it took a bit of kind of figuring out how to do that, but then it ended up being so kind of clear when she did it. And even when the plaster kind of pushed against certain edges, it allowed for this flexibility for these apertures to never quite be known how they'll open up. Um, but this was the result of that version with, with that specific form work. So at this point, I'd like to move on to this last section, which yeah, are collaborations that have been um, primarily based in the School of Interior Design, but have reached out into different parts of Toronto. And um, so I'll move into collaborations and there's three of them. So I'll move through these. And I should add Toronto is a great place for installations. It's somehow this city that is really receptive to um, like museums that open up their doors to allowing artists, designers, architects to come in. And we have a lot of festivals at different times of the year that are just great and allow these things to happen. Um, so this was a project that the Bada Shoe Museum, which is about a block and a half away from the Royal Ontario Museum, which is designed by um, Daniel Liebskin, just to give you a sense of it's kind of like a little you know museum area that we have. And it was a joint project between four students in our School of Interior Design and four students from Architectural Science. And we're actually in separate faculties. So we're not together. Um, so it's kind of a, like a big deal. We're getting together for a project. And this is a collage that was worked on. And the Bonnachou Museum invited us to come in and design something for their, their street front window that wraps a really important corner, um, St. George and Bloor. So you're seeing a little bit of the street signs there. So this was one collage that students worked on. But the mission, just to give you a sense of the Bodishu Museum, um, they described themselves as the mission of the museum is to communicate the central role of footwear in shaping the social and cultural life of humanity. The collection has over 14,000 artifacts spanning 4,500 years of history. So that's it's pretty intense. And it's really a way of understanding culture by looking at shoes over time. And so they had us go into their archives, which I did not want to leave. And I think they pretty much had to kick me out um, because it's an incredible collection of like just an overflow of shoes that they can't, you know, they don't have room to show. And it includes, you know, this like, a really important collection of indigenous North American and circumpolar footwear, which you're seeing on the right. And there's been a lot of field work that the museum has commissioned for them to understand, you know, indigenous shoemaking. And it's a really important part of scholarship and understanding the culture of Canadian indigenous, indigenous culture. And so on the left are, you know, more examples of shoes that, um, you know, range everywhere from, you know, Elton John's boots to a shoe, like John Lennon's shoes, kind of a whole bunch of, um, you know, famous shoes in the collection. And so the design team sought to translate these historical artifacts into a contemporary language using digital tools. 
And the synthesis resulted in a translation of taking the shoe profiles from different eras using parametric modeling and fabrication software, and essentially taking the center line of the shoe and developing a new extension out of that and you know, really making an elastic poche, a new depth to that space of a wall. And so the, the result was we, there was 21 panels, each four by eight, 40 by eight feet. And it consisted of, you know, wrapping around the corner as you're seeing in the bottom image. There were also LED lights installed just to be able to highlight the whole wall at night. So it had that built into it. And here you're seeing a few examples of, you know, how these surfaces kind of really emerged out. But before the unveiling of this project at the corner, I'm standing right at the corner in this view, um, and the craft paper is still up on the windows. This is where you can start seeing those profile. On the right, you can see one of the boots that were shown. On the left is another shoe. And these patterns just kind of, you know, other shoes wrap around the surface. And so when we did unveil it, you get a sense of a few more shoes that kind of move across that surface. And one taken from the window. So as pedestrians walk around that window, you also get this really nice reflection that shows up um, once again on, you know, in this kind of funny zone of poche between glass and this new wall. Um, so the next two projects are both in um, different times, but the same space. And just wanted to start off with a little bit of information to move into the next one. And it needs to start with this one, which is these three standard stoppages by Marcel Duchamp. And the next time you're in you know, the Museum of Modern Art, um, go visit this, it's a pretty great project. And in this work, what he's really doing is straddling the line between movement and stasis, between, between chance and objectivity. And this work began with three strings that were dropped basically onto a, a board where he then traced them into templates. And each string, it belongs to the language of measure, to the scientific. Um, but the addition of the time and gravity, which are also measurable and scientific, somehow ended up making it fall into this kind of realm of chance, which is many degrees away from the scientific and objective attributes. It breaks from rules that are fundamental to measurement by inserting unpredictability by just, you know, dropping and capturing what ends up when the strings drop. And so there's something about that which is both kind of right and wrong at the same time. But this idea of these templates informed this project that was a collaboration with one of my colleagues, Andrew Furman. And we submitted this project to a yearly event in Toronto called Come Up to My Room, which takes place in a historic um, hotel in Toronto. And it's part of a week long design festival that takes place in January. And we were interested in the topography lines of a certain area of Toronto, not far from us, called the Don Valley. And it's an area where we wanted to bring in, you know, this section of Toronto that is pretty drastic in its topography and bring, find a way to bring it to the inside. And we borrowed from Duchamp in terms of taking those templates and adjusting them because they had to be adjusted in order to fit into the space of an interior. So, we use that, but at the same time, we also wanted to do the research on the Don Valley. And if you're not familiar with Michael on Dace's book, In the Skin of a Lion, which I have, I have right here. I don't know if you can see me or not, <laughs> but it's a really great book. And in parts of it, it talks about the construction of this bridge over the Don Valley. And it talks about one of the characters who kind of like swings from the rafters and understands like every part of the scaffolding inside and outside and backwards and forwards. And so the body was really important to that project. And we wanted to bring the body back into this project. And so we thought about, you know, how can the body relate to a landscape? It relates by literally just walking across it, but also by things like mailing letters that kind of leave our hands and traverse across landscapes in a whole, in, you know, whole other way. So we started building up these section cuts of the Don Valley using number 10 vellum envelopes because it just kind of made sense to have that be our material. And so this is us, you know, kind of building up um, topo section by topo section and starting to layer them up just to see what this thing would start looking like because we didn't really know at the time. But we started realizing even from these from these top views that 
The effect of patterns recalled the flow of envelopes being shuffled along in a mail sorting room, um, just kind of giving us that sense of, oh yeah, there is something about the envelope relating to that. And so this is the Gladstone Hotel um, and the room. And so the owner of this hotel at the time that was recently sold, we're hoping this event will still continue, but they empty out two floors of this hotel and open it up to artists installations. And so we had room 202 and we brought the project in, which like a nice neat little envelope, it, everything folded up really well and started the installation process. Once we had our, you know, our four um, steel rods located in the ceiling, we just started building up the layers until we finally had the piece and realized that it was, you know, the landscape turned upside down, which in a funny way, walking underneath it became a cloud. So we didn't quite, you know, expect that, but that was the feedback we kept hearing from everybody. Um, some of these layers, there were 30 plus layers in it. And some of the views that came out of this, and just I think one more in this series. Um, and we did find a lot of people always taking pictures and you know, there's a big opening night that happens and everybody would kind of walk under here and walk through it, stop and take their pictures. And we loved that. Like we were so happy people were engaging it. So the next project, the last one I'll be sharing with you tonight, is also was also part of this festival from a few years ago. And it was with, at the time, three students, Jordan Evans, Ryla Jakowski, and Evan Jerry, um, who have all gone on to do amazing things. And they came to me and asked me to be the faculty advisor. And you know, I said, sure, like, let's do this. And so they originally wanted to get a space that was one of the rooms, you know, where we, they could just put their quiet installation in. And they're all they all work kind of quietly and and instead, they were given the hallway, which is where the opening night party happens. And so, you know, here you have a group of us, like really kind of quiet and subtle, and let's work with plaster. All of a sudden, like, oh my God, we have to design the party. And so, we knew that things couldn't really happen at the ground level because just populating that hallway with people showed it gets crowded, and there's no way to, you know, have something block people. So, we looked to the ceiling. And that's where the, the design of the space, you know, the installation would happen. And so one thing that we looked at when we thought about a party was the Mexican pinata, which is this really like just beautiful, colorful, interactive form. And that's what we wanted. Like we wanted all of those things in that space. So started working with models, um, materials, drawings to look at how these forms. So we, you know, kind of change the pinata to something that people could engage and could register, register their usage over the night. So we want to kind of gauge how people were looking at it um, and even changing the ceiling through their interaction. So we ended up making all these cones and the bottom part pulls out with, and it comes out with a whole bunch of surprises, candy, a few other things. Um, and the materials that we started using and I say we, but really the students are the ones that put so much effort and time and more volunteer students helped put this thing and into place and make it happen. Um, so, you know, a red ribbon was the signifier of, you know, stand here, there's something you're going to pull. Lots of these mylar cones that were made. And if you ever doubt candy be can be used as a detail, it was actually the detail that held the ribbon on the inside of these cones. Um, it was just a nice way that if it fell into your drink, it was okay to have that happen. And, and a sub ceiling was, or almost like an intermediate ceiling was put up between the original and this new surface in order to have that connection. And you can see a few of these, you know, partial cone connections down here, and then some of them being attached in their grouping. And as the night, you know, as it all came together, um, this is what you would start seeing. And the color would transition from this kind of reddish to a multicolor into one that's more of this purple bluish range. And then we had these tags at the bottom, um, a little bit like Alice in Wonderland that said, you know, pull me. And we had three different times so we could see how the ceiling would change over the course of the night. 
And so at the first poll, everybody, you know, was getting ready and, and it was amazing. Like people just, you know, found their way underneath, grabbed their 930 and was getting ready to pull. And so the DJ, you know, did a countdown. It was really um, a very active event. And that was after the first poll, standing in the hallway. And then this is Ryla over here. Um, she did the countdown for the next poll. And so you can see those cones starting to drop away, the lower section of them. And then finally, after the third poll, um, you can really see the ceiling transforming. And we had these iridescent um, paper fillers in it, that, which is what gave it the color. But eventually over the course of the event, we wanted to see how it would look when the color came out and just to kind of have it back to almost a neutral tone. So we could see that full range of like fully saturated down to like no saturation and a few other views. And then finally, you know, landing here um, with what we see from looking down up back into that space. And so that's where I will wrap up um, my talk and I hope a lot of this helps find, you know, ways into, especially for students into your work to think about some of these different spaces that we spanned. And when we start bringing these layers of flexibility and change to it, that it really begins to spark something very different than we're used to. So thank you. I guess I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Lois. Um, the questions have been coming in steadily, but but um, maybe maybe the faculty can kick things off a little bit first, but before we start to to move to the audience questions, I don't know if, if Felicia or Yasmin or DK um, would like to start, but I'm just going to open it up to to their questions and comments. Sure. Thanks so much, Lois. That was a wonderful lecture. I really enjoyed all the examples and um, love this state of in-betweenness that you're talking about that I think really reads through pretty much all the all the projects. And so I guess I had a question that's kind of maybe more of an umbrella question. Um, and it, it stems from the work that you just showed and also um, work that you had in your, that you've written about in your book, the uh, Towards a New Interior. So um, in that book, you talk about the relationship of the personal to the interior design. And I think that a lot of your work tries to connect the human body with these kind of other scales. And so I'm curious about that because I think that, um, you know, I think in one part of your book, you wrote that um, personal experience is something that it's okay to talk about an interior design, but in architecture, it's like a taboo. <laughs> and so I saw that and I was like, yeah, this, this is definitely a major um, kind of grounding point for architecture that we have, um, you know, many of our sort of theories and the way that we have been trained as architects do sort of push the body into another realm. And so I just want to um, say that I thought that was really, really interesting. And I think the work that you do potentially offers architecture to, a way of restructuring post all the riots we've had where people are saying, look, we all have different bodies. We all take up different spaces. We all inhabit space different. Like all these things are coming to the foreground, right? And so I think the work that you do really cracks that whole that kind of that theoretical kind of disciplinary boundary between interior design and architecture open. So I, I was really impressed with that. I struggled with this question a lot and I love to hear more about that aspect of your, of your work, this idea of the personal. Well, first I just wanna thank you for bringing the work into that question and that context because that actually, that really means um, a lot because it brings a lot of depth to it. And so I, so thank you for asking that question. And, you know, I have, I feel like, you know, having almost grown up in architecture, like <laughs> I think for those of us who went through architecture, so you kind of grow up in it. And there's so many 
conventions and canons that we learn, but it leaves out so much. And it also sometimes feels like it kind of um, tamps down culture and allowing even a student to bring forward you know, their own culture, to be comfortable to do that. And that's why in a lot of the works, I do like to find examples where it really feels like somebody is showing who they are, um, helping us see, you know, not just the traditional, like the canons that we've all learned or even in color theory, like we're so used to looking at, we just covered a, con a topic of this um, in the course I'm teaching right now, which includes some of those little paintings that I was doing in those six videos that, you know, moving away from those conventions and all those systems that we learn to then look at, um, like we've been looking at even the medicine wheel for indigenous cultures that have their own color relationships. And so mm -hmm. that's been a really important part for even in the teaching piece to make sure students can understand that it's, it's not just these things that are there, but there's this whole other body of knowledge that we need to tap into and expand and broaden and open up. Um, and I do think the interior somehow, it is very conducive to it. And I think it's because it allows all of those personal mm. objects, ways of identifying with either textiles, um, forms that we have, even dishware that helps bring forward more of a personal identity rather than just here's the architecture, here's the, the building, which is, it can happen sometimes, but it's when you start getting a little bit more into those things that are like touchable, <laughs> you know, when somebody actually can engage certain materials, not just things that you see, you know, 20 feet away that you can never really engage or touch, but that's where the interior, like to me, that's always one of my differences is, is it something that you can touch? <laughs> like then it becomes only in that realm of the interior scope. So yeah, so that's why I like to think of all those layers um, and clothing is one that, you know, my, my next degree is gonna be a master's in fashion. I <laughs> think that's what I've decided. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know, maybe next year, I don't know, but like I really can't. <laughs> my goal is to work for Ray Kuakaba um, for a company. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And her exhibit at the Met, I guess it was like a couple of years ago now, was just like phenomenal. Um, so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope that helps bring some, some, you know, answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. I, I think that your work really sort of unfolds that, uh, no puns intended, but <laughs> really helps um, throw that into a kind of light that is really helpful to understand with the transformation of architecture now um, and social justice and how you connect, you know, all the kind of differences, how you kind of bring that back to bear on what you're making and what you're trying to provide for people. So yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Marcus, I, I can wait uh, if you have lots of questions, but if you don't, I can also, I, I have something. It's your call. Um, there, there are some questions that are in the chat that maybe can follow up a little bit with Felicia. So maybe I'll just, I'll just throw one of them in there while you're, while you're preparing. Um, so, so this came from the chat and um, I think it's, it's a, a very basic question from the students, and it is, what tools do you think we can use to further our understanding of the flexibility of the interior? Which I think is just a great question. Yeah. 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 Um, should I jump right in with that? <laughs> that Please go ahead, Lois. Fun one. That's a fun one. Um, so a sewing machine, textiles, <laughs> that's <laughs> um, knitting machines, all of those things are really great because if we're going to talk about, you know, tools, we also have to talk about materials and what are things that are flexible. Um, to me, right away, just you know, I, I feel like this is where you know the, the architecture students sometimes have to forget about the hard materials, and we actually have to look at the soft materials or soft surfaces. And and we do tend to talk about things as hard and soft materials, and it is the kind of leap into that realm um, that does bring in a whole range of new tools to use. Um, but I also kind of like mixing and matching these things as well. So um, like I know in the past I've found ways to, you know, if you take steel, but if you start 
cutting it into smaller forms and then sewing it, you suddenly start getting these new flexible pieces, but depending upon what you're sewing with or the thickness of a material, it'll either have more flexibility or less flexibility. Um, or understanding how you can begin to layer things. Um, liquid latex is an amazing material. <laughs> um, you know, especially because you can attach it to other things. Um, so there's so many ways of working with it. I, you know, I think it's part of it is just getting out of the comfort zone of the tools and materials that, that, you know, speaking to the students that you're typically working with and working with new materials. Um, it's funny, my, even, even our interior design students, like it shocks me that some of them have not actually worked with textiles until their fourth year when, you know, I asked them to bring in three samples that they've altered and they realize like, oh, like I've never actually altered textiles. And, and it seems like a, like that should be happening. Um, but then you can also take some of those alterations and figure out like, well, what do I have to do to another kind of material to alter it? But at the same time, working with materials in ways that you're not fighting them, because I think once you start fighting a material, like you're, you're losing something that, that is inherent to it. So, so there is like no one answer to it, but I think being able to experiment and test and now is the time to do it. Like this, like being in school is the best time to be doing all of these things. Murdad, would you like to ask your question next? Sure, I'd love to. So Lois, thank you, wonderful, inspiring talk. It's not really, maybe it is a question. Um, it's about your teaching and about pedagogy. <clears throat> you showed these projects that from an architect's point of view, um, on the one hand, they rely on the scale of architecture and building and pulling apart volumes, which may be building-like and pulling apart structures, which may be building-like and finding interior from the architecture. And on the other hand, you showed these other pedagogic experiments, which started from the body, like very close, right? So like building things here and, and so these two kind of, you know, they're not really extremes, but in, in the way that I'm seeing them in relationship to interior, they do present two extremes. One is beyond the exterior. The other one is very much detail and close up. And so you're using these two things to get to the interior. It's a strategic, a very interesting strategic approach that in order to get to something here, you're not starting here, you're studying somewhere over there and somewhere over there, and, and you're getting students to come to the middle, to the interior. I, so it's an observation on one hand, but I wonder if, if, if you can kind of enlighten us on the strategy that has led you here. Yeah, and, and that's a really nice way of thinking about those two parts. And I feel like everything to me is always kind of elastic and trying to, you know, like pull them apart or separate them or finding some way to bridge them. And, and honestly, I find a little bit of frustration even with those early casts that they do. Um, and I constantly tell the students like, this is full scale, this is full scale. Like it's, you know, it's an interior, but it's a full scale interior. And so I don't want them to start thinking, oh, it's a building. And it's like, no, it's just, you know, your, your four by four by four box and it is full scale. And so we, we make them work that way throughout the entire semester, even when they scan the pieces, put them into those collages, I'm constantly reminding them of that. And I think to me, that's one of the biggest challenges and leaps in those scales is when architects work, it's always, you know, that like outside in a, in a conceptual scale and the interior, the great thing about it is that so much of it is close to the body. And so it ends up being tested at full scale. Um, and I think that's where I always like this idea of how can we test those things at full scale. But um, but yeah, that container of the box, it always feels like, like oh, like <laughs> so frustrating. It's the real container and it, you know, it's, it looks like a building. But I do like to think of it as always being 
full scale along the way. And, and when the students work on those wood constructs that hold up the pieces, um, actually the intent of that part is to get them to start thinking about gravity. And so that's the main goal of that. In some ways that whole part, we call it scaffold and structure. And it really is about just understanding gravity. And so that's why they sometimes have to work with these kind of like lumbering heavier plaster pieces and figuring out how to like delicately support it. Because then I remind them, you know, you have like light fixtures, you know, hanging above somebody's head and, um, and that they have to be accountable for understanding how all these things work on the interior. So not that they're necessarily doing the load bearing type of structure and understanding that, but it's understanding how gravity pertains to the interior. And so how a body, you know, sits on a piece of furniture that they might make or design. Um, and so that's always kind of reinforced with them along the way. But um, but yes, at some point there will be the project where the two merge. <laughs> Next year. <laughs> Lois, I think Yasmin ha has a question for you, one of our faculty. Oh, I, you're kind. Uh, I, <clears throat> I, first of all, I wanted to thank you very much for this talk. It's very inspiring. Um, and um, I, I had, there, there are two, I don't know if this is really a question, but I, I had two elements that I thought were absolutely incredible. When you started talking about thinking about um, working inside out, uh, the idea and that how even formally uh, engaging the student to think about like working inside out and not outside in. And I, um, and I think what if, you know, as an architect, we were to design building inside out instead of like designing outside in, um, like we unfortunately always do. That, that was like fabulous to, to hear. Um, the other element that I thought that was really, really incredibly um, uh, enlightening was that, you know, when you start giving shape to uh, the intangible. Um, and I think that the, the, your drawing in particular that gives shape to that, that ray of light that brings in and then suddenly, you know, it becomes a, a, a it's, it's, it's a shape that surrounds a void uh, it's present in um, in in other um, work um, that you did presented. For example, the shape of the the fabric that becomes solid. And I'm thinking of the work of Anne Holtrop, for example, as well, who is using who is casting uh, basically walls uh, using fabric. I think it's uh, it's it's quite a, fa a fascinating uh, take on. Um, the idea of giving shape or giving form to something that is doesn't have any <laughs> or you know and how do you actually make this intangible uh, more interactive or more tangible I mean this of course speaks to the idea of atmosphere or the ideas the connection with the mood so um I don't know if this is really a question, but I maybe if you if if there is a link between the two, I would love to hear more about it. Thank you. Yeah, um, and that's and I think all the different things you touched upon are um, really central to the work, and especially when I think of like Doho Sa's work and those beautiful textile interior spaces that he makes. Um, you know, I just like I I just want to go there and, and turn them inside out. And I always wonder why aren't we doing that with our models, like actually making fabric models and turning them inside out. Like <laughs> it's almost really bringing outside to inside. And, you know, it's on, it's on my list of like things to do that pops up in my calendar repeatedly every month. Like, oh yeah, I need to make that model, <laughs> which I haven't made yet. But like, I think it'd be a really almost an interesting spatial study for especially students to do to see what that, like, how would you do that? And where would you kind of bump up into problems? And, mm -hmm. you know, how do you have to adjust the textile to make like an opening that suddenly might get closed or you might find new openings? Mm -hmm. And are there things that we can take from that and then translate into like the world of built materials that suddenly it, it's a way of informing those more heavy duty materials. Mm -hmm. um, 
And so that's where there's a bit of that, that dialogue mm -hmm. that can happen between the two, um, especially seeing how textiles can go and help form those concrete surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, and Kentaro um, Tsubaki at, I'm forgetting where he is, but he's also, a, he graduated a year or two before me um, at Cranbrook. And since then, he has also been doing just beautiful castings with textiles and plaster, um, and even showing all like the geomet geometrical drawings that accompany them. And they're just like breathtaking, like really beautiful. So, so it's out there. I feel like there's, you know, people doing these things in different places. <laughs> um, we just all need to get together and <laughs> and share our textiles. But, um, but yeah, I think it's when these materials do have these relationships back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you. There's a question in the chat um, that I'll, I'll read to you, Lois. It says, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. And it has an excl exclamation point behind it. <laughs> in the Batum Show Museum installation, it was mentioned that parametric modeling was utilized. If parametric modeling was to be used by the students in creating their clothing projects, what potential benefits or drawbacks could there be? Um, would this make their design process more or less flexible? So this is going back to uh, tools questions and, and maybe digital tools. Yeah, that is great. And and whoever asked that question, please, please, please like, do that. <laughs> Don't wait, start doing that. Um, I think, you know, it's one more set of tools that could help and um, I mean, one of the things that we've been looking at is a lot of like 3D scanning the body um, and that in itself begins to start forming that diagram. Um, I know gymnasts, there's all these like, you know, great studies being done showing mostly from like a physical therapy side, showing how gymnasts move, but to be able to track their movements and understanding how the body is moving, how joints are moving. Um, and that also ends up moving into healthcare as well and visualizing the body, which then informs what we do in our spaces and how we make our spaces. So, so all of that is linked and connected in really um, informative and great ways. And so, you know, I think there's different tools that can be used, um, obviously, you know, the, just like the static 3D scan is one. Um, motion capture would be another one that actually can document how somebody does move through a space. And, um, and to me, that's a really important one because also whether, you know, we're abled or disabled, it's something that should be done to track how we're using our spaces from all different body types. And, you know, that can then show like where we can be adjusting our spaces rather than just, like returning back to representation of the body that has always been used. So, um, but the motion capture one, I think has so much potential because it kind of leaves from the body clothing and moves into something that's spatial. And I think that's where it can get really exciting. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna keep going through these. I don't know who asked that, um, but <laughs> Thank you for the answer. Uh, here's a question from Niles. Thanks, Niles, for putting your name. <laughs> Where, how do you envision this elasticity? And he has in parentheses after that augmentation um, being used in a larger scale. Or do you feel that this form of exploration is more effective at a smaller scale? Definitely not <laughs> just on a smaller scale. Um, I think maybe because of the kind of quick assignments and knowing that I have a semester at a time to work with students that the pace is kind of quick. So those are some of the examples that we work through. But I think, you know, if you're already at a point where you can start working with some of those tools and jumping right in, that's where, you know, once again, we might not know where you'll find the elasticity, but there's so many great programs that allow for, you know, different ways of expanding or contracting or what, or ideas of that, you know, can shape, reshape materials, spaces. Um, but I think all of that is completely open and it would be great to see what happens next with that. So, and I don't think it has to be limited to just the immediate scale. Like once again, that means, you know, just because I, I tend to have my students work at the immediate scale 
of the body or what they can make in our workshop, like directly in front of us, um, doesn't mean that there can't be that leap of working in the virtual realm as well, because obviously we're all doing that right now, but even developing those ideas in a virtual realm. Um, I should also add, we, while I showed you some images of our workshop in the, I think it was maybe a year and a half ago, or even just a year ago, we opened up a new digital fabrication lab called the Creative Technology Lab, which is also directed by my co-author, co-editor, Jonathan Anderson on our forthcoming book. And it's just all about digital tools. And so we're starting to see you know, faculty, students using those tools um, in ways that are now moving out of the traditional workshop and into this whole new digital lab. Thank you. On behalf of Niles, <laughs> um, I I was wondering if I could return to something that Yasmin was saying. Um, she, you raised the question, Yasmin, of the the invisible, like the things that you can't see or that aren't um, easily kind of perceived by people. And I guess I had a question that was kind of related to that, um, and it, it kind of goes something like this do you think that the relationship between interior and exterior has changed because of all the kind of invisible technologies that we have interweaving the presence of our body in space do you think that that has changed the way in which we operate think or can understand um, this in between space that you raise with your work. So, you know, we cross a threshold and actually, you know, we get scanned as we go in and a certain amount of data is taken off of us and beamed into somewhere. And so I, I'm just asking, do you think that changes this problem of inside and outside? And, and is there an inside and outside anymore? Yes, inside and outside has has become so complex. Like it's not just as straightforward um, as taking, you know, a plan cut section and seeing, oh, here's the poche and here's inside, here's outside. But if we actually built in, you know, and we're able to represent all of the technology and finding ways to have that be evident in those drawings, I think that would begin to show how, you know, some things begin to shrink or compress because technology is now taking on a new layer. Um, you know, and I know there's there's different you know studies that that are happening of of you know thinking about oh are we surrounding ourselves by too much technology? Um, I don't know too much about it, but um, in terms of like health effects on on us, but um, but I do know that it would be interesting to start adding those as layers to this idea of a map and whether it's you know the three-dimensional map or the two-dimensional map, but something that really reveals you know what's happened like over time, what's been happening in a certain type of space, um, you know, especially new buildings where more technology has come in, has that shrunk the poche, um, or have things like curtains had to be added. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I, I think there's still something about interior and exterior still being about um, visibility and how much of us we do want to be visible, whether it's virtually in this virtual realm or mm -hmm. in the physical realm. And we know that we have all different building types, you know, historical buildings, you know, ones that endure over time, new buildings that are meant to endure over time where the wall has been made thinner. Um, and some of that seems to be more just about a preference for a building type and the materiality of it. But the part about the virtual um, interior, like to me, that's grown, like it's grown exponentially to the point where it's hard to gauge. But I would also say that we don't pay enough attention to other parts that are invisible on the interior um, and like indoor air quality. Like those are things that are like so important to our health. And yet we just kind of like, we don't even document that in our drawings. Like we don't mm -hmm. even think about particle emission that comes out and are we representing that over the course of a day? And you can almost map that to time over the course of a day. Like when someone's cooking, that's emitting particles. 
And so there's like all these things you can do, but you know, I'm probably getting too much into detail <laughs> on that, but, um, but I think, you know, it's, there's many layers to that, that we could be looking at. Yeah. Thank you. So maybe we should wrap up. Um, Lois, thank you so much. Uh, this was just such a, a, a great and timely um, talk. And, and I think, you know, um, what you've injected into the discussion in the department um, is super valuable. You know, um, not only thinking about COVID, um, but, you know, uh, a kind of recognition of how critical the body is as, as a measure and as a tool and as a form giver. Um, you know, really, really great stuff. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for these great questions. Um, this is really just such a pleasure to join you. Thank you. <laughs> We'd love to have you Thank back you. to our class, Lois. So we'll try to organize that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lois Thank and everybody. Much. Thank you, Marcus and Thank DK so for organizing all of this. Thank Lois, you. Let's, let's grab a coffee, Lois. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> bye bye.